Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Costas. Hello, very, very good to see you again. Miss you, my friend. And our guest today is going to talk about the, um, we can say a little Christian Republic of Meteora. So, but he'll be talking about much more than that. Um, so Costas, without taking too much time, uh, please, uh, your turn. So thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Thank you, Father Elia, for inviting me. Thank you, Maria and uh, the Easy Guide for inviting me uh, into this uh, conference from Greece. Uh, uh, for us, the archaeologists and the guides, it's a nice opportunity to practice our English again because we haven't, we haven't spoken foreign languages for the last two years because of the pandemic. So we apologize for any uh, mistakes. I'm, I'm starting sharing what I prepared for you. Would you, would you please verify if, uh, if you see my sharing? Yes, we see your sharing. It's not full screen, but we see, uh, yeah, perfect. It's not, Fantastic. It's not full screen. Fantastic. So, the, the topic I have chosen is not only about Metera, it is mostly uh, Metera geologically, Metera uh, in Christianity, and Metera as, uh, as a place where a very specific art has been developed from the 13th to the 16th century uh, AD. Uh, and the titles from geological formation to the monastic societies. Uh, uh, we are broadcasting from this part of the world, the Mediterranean, and more precisely from Thessaloniki. This is where we are. And Metera is a place situated in central Greece in a region which is called the Thessaly, exactly here. Uh, talking about etymology of uh, the, the word meteora, it, it derives from the word, uh, from the Greek word meteorum, which means something which is pending between the earth and the sky, something which is suspended in the air, like, for example, a meteorite. And this is exactly what I mean. These are the rocks of meteora uh, resembling being between the earth and the skies. The issue is how these geological formations were uh, appeared in, uh, in Thessaly, how uh, these formations have emerged and when. According to the geologists, uh, at about 20 to 30 million years before, that place that uh, I showed you before, the plain of Thessaly, was covered by a sea, or more precisely, by a big lake. It was a part of the Tiffys Sea uh, on the west side of the Aegean Sea 20 to 30 million, to 30 million years before. Uh, after a geological phenomenon which may be, may be interpreted as a big earthquake, a big river uh, uh, entering into the big lake uh, disappeared because of the earthquake and the lake disappeared and became one with the Aegean Sea. And this is how the delta of the river and the lake, the, the delta in the region where the river met the lake in the Thessalian plain became what we call today Meteora. Meteora is not a granite. Meteora is not marble. Be Meteora rocks okay, yeah. is a conglomerate, is rocks that were formated because of the alluvial deposits of the delta after this uh, big flood, 25 to 30, um, uh, to, to, to 30 million years before. So all this accumulation of uh, alluvial deposits of the delta within the years and the, within the centuries became this rock 
see in the beautiful uh, 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 pictures that are not mine. These are pictures of Boissonat, a French painter of uh, the uh, end of the 19th century. This geological phenomenon is not referred in the Greek history. The only text into which we may say that it is mentioned is the myth of the Deucalion and Pyrrha. Deucalion and Pyrrha is a myth which is not a very common and very well-known myth in the Greek mythology. It's, it, it may be considered as the Greek version of the biblical, the biblical flood. And what is it about? The God says that the generation of the copper in the earth are sinners, so they need to be punished. So God chooses a couple, Deucalion and Pyrrha. He proposes them to construct a boat, Noah's Ark, mm -hmm. and to save themselves. And according to this uh, ancient Greek mythological tradition, after the flood, the boat stands on the top of different mountains, maybe Olympus, maybe Osa, maybe Othris, or maybe the mountains in Thessaly. According to this latter version, the mountain was the region of Thessaly, and indeed the, the two survivors, Deucalion and Pyrrha, got out of the ark, started walking on the desert land, holding black stones in their hands and starting throwing the stones behind them. So from the stones thrown behind Deucalion, the male, the Elinus were born, and from the stones thrown behind the shoulders of uh, Pyrrha, the female, the Elinidas uh, were born. Elinus and Elinidas are the citizens of Greece, alas. Because las in ancient Greek means the stone. So the offsprings of the stones are the stone people. This means the Greeks. This is a version of the myth. And if we can, uh, if, if we can look at a geological incident corresponding to this mythological reference, it might be the formation of Meteora rocks. I'm talking about this because geological formations and geological phenomena are very rarely uh, uh, referred into the history of a place. And especially in Greece, all the geological phenomena are only referred into the mythology, not in the history. I will give you a second exam example. For example, we talk about the peninsula of Mount Athos or the peninsula of Chalkidiki, which is called the Paline, this was the mythological place of the battle between the Greek gods and the giants, the so-called giantomachy. So since the whole battle made a lot of noise and turbulence, this peninsula was called Paline because of the verb palome, which means a vibrating peninsula. This this uh, geological phenomenon of the earthquakes and the volcanic eruptions that took place somehow and somewhere in the Greek uh, uh, geological history is not referred into the history. It is referred into the Greek mythology and, of course, into the names of the place, like, like the, uh, the peninsula of Paline, that took the name because of the vib vibrations of the earth. And this is a depiction. Uh, uh, what, uh, what I'm sharing with you is a depiction of, um, uh, of a painting um, um, portraying Deucalion and Pyrrha, doing exactly what I described, throwing stones, meaning in ancient Greek, las, elas, stones behind their shoulders and the stones becoming uh, the Greeks males and the Greek females. And this is exactly the geography of the region. We see the rocks of Meteora here 
on the right, and here on the left of the river, we suppose that that was the region of the delta of the river uh, in exactly in the place where the river met the big lake. The big lake vanished, disappeared because of the earthquake, and what, left, what was left was the alluvial deposits that progressively became the rocks of Meteora, pending now between earth and skies. And this is exactly um, uh, a, a photograph uh, portraying, uh, I think, with, in the best way, uh, uh, what we suppose, what the, geolo the, the, the geologists suppose, that uh, there was uh, a big uh, lake that disappeared, leaving behind it these formations of rocks. I'm sharing with you silently uh, some aerial photos of Meteora. Wow. Some of those remind us even uh, priests, like this one, or hermits or monks. After this geological phenomenon, the first uh, human presence which is attested in the area is situated very close to uh, Meteora rocks. It is the Theopetra cave. Theopetra, it is Theopetra linguistically. It is the, uh, the stone of, of God because it is situated very close to the monasteries of uh, Meteora. In Theopetra, there is a cave. I'm showing you the entrance of the cave right here. And where uh, life uh, was attested uh, dating back to what we call here in Greece the Mesolithic period, which is 30 to 20,000 year, years before Christ. So it is between the Paleolithic people and the Neolithic people. Uh, very shortly, I'm um, explaining a few things about what we call the Neolithic people. And the Neolithic people are the uh, uh, people living mostly in um, Mesopotamian and uh, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean during the 10th million, 10,000, 10,000 to 7,000 BC. Uh, these are the people that are implied mostly with what we call the Neolithic revolution. It's not a revolution that happened in one moment. It's a revolution that lasted many, many years. And it has to do with the passage from the hunters and gatherers to the agriculturers. It is the uh, revolution of the agriculture. Here in uh, Theopetra cave, we are in between. We have people living inside the caves. So these people belonged to what we call the, uh, the, the hunters and gatherers, but progressively they started also living outside. So this cave marks the passage between the old life, the Mesolithic, the, uh, the Paleolithic life, the hunters and gatherers, and the new life that began with what we call the Neolithic revolution, when the, uh, the men started having uh, stable residences, they wouldn't move from one place to the other hunting animals. They discovered the power of the earth, they discovered the power of the power of the agriculture, and this is how, in a way, a civilization started talking linguistically again, civilization, meaning they created cities. So they became citizens and they, they became civilized because they started cultivating the earth. So in between, in this area, they were living in what we call the Theopetra cave, but this is not the, uh, the issue of our presentation this, um, uh, this afternoon. So I continue uh, after having explained, I think, uh, the geological formations, which are obviously here uh, created because of the erosion of the rocks 
and of course because of the conglomerate of the alluvial deposits. These are two rocks uh, 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 showing the appearance of two monks arriving in Meteora. These are not monks, these are real rocks. But I'm taking this as an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what we call the ascetic or the ascetic life, the life of the hermits living in the desert. So what happens between the 5th and the 9th century AD is that for different reasons, people in the East Mediterranean, in the Middle East, in the Sinai, in Greece, in uh, in what we call today Turkey, in what we call today Greece, in, 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 in this place of the Eastern Byzantine Empire, let us say, people started leaving the secular world to live abundant in the desert, in the highlands, in places very close to uh, whatever every, every one of, the, of these people uh, meant by saying the God. So they wanted to approach the God. So they started living alone, either on a pillar, these are called the stilite, stylets, living on the upper part of, um, of a column, uh, or the hermits living in the desert, because this word is cor correspondent to the Greek word Eremos, hermit, or living an ascetic life, living a life practicing by eating only uh, uh, some uh, herbs and crops from, uh, from the earth and practicing by praying to the gods. So this is a phenomenon that uh, we, we, can, we, can, we can see it from the 5th to the 9th century AD. And I, I can tell you, to me, it is, um, it is not very easily explainable. It has a lot of explanations. For example, people say that uh, there were so many war affairs in the area uh, during the 5th uh, to, uh, to the 9th century AD. So people started leaving the big cities and uh, the... Um, uh, and the villages to, uh, to be abundant in the outskirts of the cities, on the outskirts of the villages, on the outskirts of the civilized world, to be abundant very close to God. But to me, it's mostly, uh, uh, it, it's, rather, it's rather a spiritual, a spiritual um, research. Uh, we we talk about some uh, uh, we talk about a period, fifth to ninth century A.D., uh, where people all over the East Mediterranean, all over all over the middle uh, the, the Middle East, feel alone. They feel alone because of many many uh, uh, political and strategical issues. They feel alone because they live in big, big empires. We have a huge Roman empire, which is progressively uh, replaced by what, what we call the Eastern Roman Empire, which is the Byzantine Empire. And when we have an empire and we have an emperor, we have, uh, we have people living in what we can call an ecumenical world. An ecumenical world, it's a globalized society. And within a globalized society, such as our society today, people feel alone. Many people cannot find themselves in cities because there are not any more small cities that are independent, like in the democracy of ancient Greece, such as Athens or different small cities that are created to be independent independent, and to take the decisions for themselves. Now, in the, let us say, in the history of the empires, within an empire, there are people feeling this loneliness. And the loneliness uh, will drive them 
to the outskirts. And the outskirts is the place where God is hidden. We can talk for hours, Father Elia, or we can talk for days about this issue. I'm just giving you an outline of my opinion about how we can explain uh, the fact that we, we don't have, still we don't have monastic societies until the ninth, 10th century AD, we only have hermits or people living in the desert, abandoning the secular world in favor of what we call the spiritual world, in favor of what we call a world very close to God. And this is what I mean by the Meteora rocks. Meteora rocks are inhabited uh, during the 9th century by this kind of hermits. This is what remain from the hermitages of the 9th century AD that were redeveloped and inhabited again and again um, in the course of the centuries. And this is exactly uh, on the left we see some caves, to the right we see a part of um, the fresco paintings depicting a hermit, a hermit living in a cave. And again, hermitages uh, date back from the 9th to the 12th, 13th century AD. So we still uh, have in mind that these people living in Meteora inside the caves, inside these ge geological formations, they live alone, not in communities. Another word for uh, these hermitages um, uh, in, in Greece is called skite. Skite is the place where we exercise ourselves. And this is how they, um, uh, they used to, uh, to climb up to find these rocks and to live their lives there. Only in the 13th century, these uh, her uh, hermits living in the caves in Meteora started having a communal life, but not every day, only on Sundays. And this is why this, uh, this particular church that um, I'm showing you now is called the Kiryako. It is called the Dupiani church uh, between the village Kastraki and Meteora. It is the church used from the 13th century onwards as the place of the assembly of the hermits uh, every Sunday. So uh, we have the first, uh, let us say, um, uh, the first uh, uh, appearances, the first uh, uh, attested communal life every Sunday in Meteora uh, during the 13th century AD in what we call the Kiryakon because Kiryaki in Greek is Sunday, the place of the assemblage every Sunday. I'm showing you how they used to climb up uh, to construct the monasteries. And this communal life of the 13th century, I'm showing you uh, some of the remnants of the, uh, uh, of the deserted monasteries that uh, do not exist anymore. I have to tell you that in, the, in Meteora, there used to be 25 monasteries, there exist today only six, uh, four with monks and two nunneries. The other ones are abounded progressively by the time, and one of those is what I'm showing you now. The second one, which is not inhabited, uh, it is abounded, but uh, it, it, it is still standing. Uh, it's the monastery of Ipapandi, uh, uh, somewhere lost in the middle of, no, of the nowhere in, uh, in the rocks of Meteora. But it used to be a skite, a hermitage that became progressively a monastery in the 14th century AD. That's the same one extended to uh, the west under the sheltering rock. And finally, from 
the end of 13th, be beginning of the 14th century AD, new monastic societies, new monastic clusters started being built on the top of these steep rocks, like this one. For those who like uh, James Bond, this one uh, appears to the James Bond film for your eyes right. only. The, this is the place where the scene with the helicopter is depicted in the film. Another monastic society, another two monastic societies here. The monastery of uh, Rusanu and another abandoned um, monastery. The picture shows exactly why these places were chosen. They were chosen because they provided uh, this natural fortification. Nobody could touch them. And this is why during the whole um, uh, period of the Ottoman occupation uh, in Greece and Byzantine Empire from the uh, 14th, 15th century AD until uh, uh, very recently for Macedonia, very recently, beginning of the 20th century, uh, beginning of the 19th century for the rest of Greece, all these places were not occupied by the Ottomans. Again, uh, the St. Trinity Monastery, and in the background we can see uh, the mountain, a part of the mountain of uh, Pindos, which is called Kerketion or Kosiakas, and uh, between the mountain and the rock of St. Trinity we can see the uh, this small town of Kalambaka, Kalambaka, uh, an Ottoman name though, Kalambaka, which is the um, the the beauty the beautiful uh, fort, the beautiful castle, Kalambak. Uh, so probably you you are you wonder how would they climb up there to transfer the building materials. Not like that. They would climb like that with ladders. The first would climb with a ladder and then he would be able to throw um, uh, a net so that uh, uh, the building materials uh, uh, can climb up and start building the whole constructions. We see an example of um, visitors of the early 20th century uh, of one of the monasteries of Medeira climbing up with ladders. Many accidents happened, not only in the 20th century, but also during the whole history of the constructions of Medeira. Many, many people died uh, trying to reach uh, the skies, trying to reach the top of the, uh, of the rocks to build the monasteries until uh, finally in the 1930s, um, uh, the building of, uh, um, uh, of staircases that allow us to go up and visit as, vid as visitors now the monasteries. It is uh, difficult to understand uh, who supported financially this effort of uh, the um, hermits who wanted to become part of the monastic society because it's, it, it used to be a very, very expensive uh, uh, effort to build monasteries on the top of, uh, of rocks. Um, I can assure you that this would never have happened uh, if they hadn't the support of the Byzantine emperors. In a very curious and uh, mysterious way, the Byzantine emperors supported psychologically, financially, and spiritually the building of monasteries. They were even monks themselves, some of them. I'm showing you Ioannis Vatagis uh, on the left, and all these uh, series of the dynasty of the Paleologues, the, um, uh, the Byzantine emperors 
of the 14th century AD, 14th century AD, marks what we call a renaissance within the Byzantine Empire. I'm, I will try to do a parenthesis now just to explain you what the Byzantine Empire is. The Byzantine Empire is the continuity of the Roman Empire. There is no difference between Roman apart from a new capital and the new religion. Of course, there are differences, but the Roman Empire is an empire that starts in the East in around the second century before Christ, before Christ and continues, let us say, until the Ottoman occupation in the 14th, 15th century AD. Father Elia, you will tell me you're doing a mistake here. It's not like that. We have a Byzantine empire. That's right. And when do we have a Byzantine empire? We have a Byzantine empire after Constantine, not me, the great. Constantine the Great, fourth century AD. It is the first Roman emperor who is baptized Christian. It is the first emperor who issues the decree of Milan, which means religious tolerance. Everybody has the right in the empire to uh, worship whatever God they like. So most of them are Christian. So Christianity becomes the, uh, the, uh, the main religion and the official re religion in, uh, in, the Roman, uh, in the Roman Empire. And uh, uh, even though in the fourth century AD, nobody calls the people living in this empire, the Byzantines. If we walked in the streets of Constantinopolis or Thessaloniki or uh, uh, whatever big uh, town or city in this area and called somebody AU Byzantine, he would never answer. They answered only to the appeal Roman. So they continued being Roman. And this distinguishing is something that uh, uh, happened by the scholars in the 17th century in order to distinguish the, the Roman Empire before and after Constantine the Great. So what else did he do? Constantine the Great, he transferred the capital from Rome to Byzantium, a city uh, in Propontis between, let us say, Europe and Asia, and he gave a new name to this city. He named the city after himself, Constantinopolis. And this is why when we talk today about the empire after Constantine the Great, we talk about the Byzantine empire. So this is what happens after the fourth century AD. And this Byzantine empire has a name. The aim is to to regain all the lost uh, territories that had already lost uh, after the conquests of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, who died in the end of the fourth century uh, AD, it is uh, a personality that is mostly referred by the Byzantine uh, uh, emperors. Most of them, uh, and especially the Paleologues held as a name to regain the, ter the territories of the uh, former uh, uh, ecumenical society that had been created by Alexander the Great in the fourth century before Christ. This is Byzantium in the 14th century AD. And this is what the Paleologues want to do. A total Renaissance, political Renaissance and um, uh, spiritual renaissance, and of course, renaissance in the art in the, fourth, in the 14th century AD. So in this frame, we have to see uh, the way they are implied to the construction of the monasteries, not only in Meteora, but all over the places in the uh, Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire. We see the Byzantine Empire under the realm of the Paleologues. 
Mediterranean Sea. Here we are in Thessalonica. Here is the capital of the Byzantine Empire, Constantinopolis. And here is one of the local uh, kings of the Byzantium, Simeon Uros, Uros is in Greek, which is a Serbian local king who supported very much the um, uh, formation of the monasteries in Meteora. In this family, we have uh, an Ioannis, John, John Uros, uh, who is one of the um, uh, of the creators of the um, um, uh, of of the donators of um, of the monastery of uh, Great Meteoron, the uh, monastery of the Transfiguration, uh, the biggest monastery in Meteora. So, a member of the royal family, a member of the family of the emperors, becomes a monk in uh, in the monastery. This is a very strange thing. We cannot imagine uh, how this could happen today, but we talk about a very strange period of uh, the history. Um, and there is also, specifically in Meteora, there is a significant role in building monasteries of the royal family of the Serbian dynasty of Nemanja. The Nemanjas and the Paleologues had relationship, they had weddings between the members of the families. I remind you, or not, I remind you, a very sad story that uh, took place some decades earlier from uh, the um, uh, foundation of uh, the first monastery in Meteora. The Serbian king, we call him the Serbian Kral Milutin, offered to the Thessalonians, to the citizens of Thessaloniki, a church uh, this is the church I'm showing you, the Church of St. Nicholas the Orphan. As a result of a peace agreement with, between the Serbians and the Byzantines, he offered this, this church, but he was offered as a wife, the seven-year-old uh, daughter of um, uh, the Byzantine king, uh, the, uh, um, uh, of the Paleologues. Uh, it, 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 these are these are very strange things that we cannot understand today. How uh, uh, a girl aged seven years uh, to, to 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 get to get married to uh, to the Serbian king he was offered because of, of the peace agreement. So they have very close relations between the Nemanjas and the Byzantine Paleologues, and this is why uh, we have so many churches. Uh, in Serbia and in the central and northern Greece that, uh, that have the same iconographic influence, let us say, because all these, all these churches were painted with fresco paintings by uh, two or three groups of very famous painters. We will talk about this uh, later. The name of the daughter that was offered to uh, the Serbian king was uh, Simonis. She suffered very much, I can assure you. <laughs> what is the monastery? We see a plan of the monastery. The monastery is a small society. In the center of this society, there is always, uh, let us say, number 10, uh, a central courtyard. And by the courtyard in the center, there is always a church, the central church of the society. And all these complexes is surrounded by the place inhabited by the monks. For example, number three is the cells of the monks and all the other facilities surrounding the church. There, is, there isn't something particular in the other monasteries. I'm showing you again the same pattern. The monastic community surrounds the central courtyard and somewhere in the center, there is the one A here. There is the central church of the monastery. And of course, in the, some of the monasteries, there is not enough place. Uh, so it is a very, very narrow uh, surface on the top of the rock. So 
uh, we still have uh, a central courtyard, but the main church is at the edge, very close to, uh, uh, to, to the steep rock. And of course, privileges were given to the monks of the monasteries from the 14th century AD, by whom they were given privilege, privileges to the monks by, of course, the members of the royal of the royal family who owned the earth. The earth was given to uh, to the monks, but the cultivation of the earth happened. People of the of the village uh, of the villages in the area, the uh, nearby villages, Kastraki today. Monastic life, just a few words. The monastic life is divided in, let us say, uh, into three, eight hours praying, eight hours resting, and eight hours working. They wake up very early in the morning for uh, the first liturgy, the matins, which is around four o'clock. Uh, the, uh, the main liturgy is around midday, and the vespers are around four to five in the afternoon, and in between what the monks do, they do the akonimata. The akonimata means the, uh, the works, the job they have to do in favor of our Lord, in favor of God. Apart from praying, there are people responsible for the church, a nunnery, cooking, and after doing all these jobs, they have a common place for the assembly, which is called the Catholicon. This is the church with the dome. The Catholicon is a Greek word meaning a place for everyone, a place where the assembly the assembly takes place for everybody in the monastery. So this is the main church, which is called Catholicon. And another aspect of Catholicon with the domes of the narthex and the central dome of the main church. And what happens in the narthex of Catholicon, we'll talk about uh, the iconography in a few minutes. Of course, there is a refectory where Almost everybody eat in the same time. I'm saying almost because there is always one, somebody who doesn't eat. He is somebody who is sitting here and uh, reads hymns to the Virgin Mary and to Christ while the other members of the community are sitting and eating. They eat within 10 minutes, not more. So eating is not um, is not a pleasure for the monks. Eating is something that keeps us alive to continue living uh, very close to the God. They have everything they should have, a wine cellar. This is my question as well. If you ask uh, uh, the authors that wrote books about the monastery of Varlam, they will tell you this is a 16th century uh, uh, oak barrel for water. The monks, some of the monks will tell you this is for wine. This, this, this remains a question. A kitchen, a half for cooking, and uh, a part of the tower with the net and the interior of uh, the tower. This is, uh, this is uh, where exactly uh, the communication with uh, the secular world begins uh, uh, in a monastery, the tower of the monastery with the net. The interior of the cell of a monk. Of course, they need to be an ossuary because there is not too much space for the cemetery. There, is, there are always very, very small cemeteries by the Catholic churches but they need to have ossuaries as well. And if, uh, if you don't mind, let us uh, 
say a few things about what we see as a visitors while entering into these monasteries. And here we'll talk about the principles and the conventions of um, the Byzantine Christian art. So what the Christian art does is first of all, it abolishes the light of the secular world. It abolishes the perspective and of course it abolishes the earthly time and space. I repeat, it abolishes the perspective, it abolishes the earthly time and space, it abolishes the light of the secular world. And let us see these examples um, uh, by seeing uh, icons or fresco paintings that we find in these six monasteries in Matera. First of all, it's a two-dimensional world. Why do we have a two-dimensional world? Because we need in this Byzantine tradition to have a spiritual world, the world of the church, the world depicted in the churches of, of the uh, East Byzantine Empire, meaning in churches uh, more or less situated in Greece, Serbia, uh, uh, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Albania, uh, Turkey, West Turkey, all these Byzantine churches that still exist uh, have as an iconographical program icons and fresco paintings depicting not a material world, but a spiritual world. So, in order to avoid depicting material world, we should abolish the third dimension, meaning the, uh, the depth. We have only the width and the, the height. We don't have the perspective, because if we had the perspective, we, we would have a, um, a realistic life, a real world, a material world, and we don't want to do this. Instead of the perspective depiction, in most of cases, we have a golden background. And this golden background, background I also have a golden background, I, I just noticed it, but this is not Byzantine. A golden background is evocative of the light of God. It evocates the light of the God, which is a light which is not created by somebody. It is an uncreated uh, uh, light. Uh, shall I admit this? I did it. I did it already. Thank you very much, Father. Yep. Sure, sure. Let, uh, let, me, let, you, let me give you a second example of, uh, um, uh, of uh, abolishing not only the perspective, but abolishing the time and abolishing the, the, the real time and the earthly time. Take a look at Jesus. Jesus is depicted as a shrunk adult. He is even having a receding hairline. Uh, so it, he is de depicted as a baby. As, and also as an, as an adult in, in the same time. And take a look at the Virgin Mary. Uh, we talk about paintings of the same period. Or, uh, apparently this is 14th to 15th century AD painting. Let us compare this one to, to, uh, to an icon, to a, to, 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 to a painting to the Virgin Mary of Michelangelo, for example, or of um, Raffaello of the Italian Renaissance to see the difference. The Italian Renaissance painters, despite the fact that they paint religious icons like the Virgin Mary with Jesus, they have models. I mean, they have real babies, fat, beautiful, uh, uh, reddish color, uh, real babies that are, are portrayed in the icon. They, they are real models. And of course, the Madonnas of Michelangelo and Raffaello are real 
top models of the 15th and 16th century AD. It is as if we, we can see these women walking on the streets of Florence or of Rome and talk to them and say to them, ah, oh, I know you because I saw you as an icon in Santa Croce painted by Michelangelo. So these are real figures having the third dimension, having all these uh, uh, perspective depiction and really the Madonna of Michela the Madonnas of Michelangelo of the Renaissance painters look like women. They have breasts, they have all the characteristics of the women. They are beautiful women. And of course, the babies are beautiful babies. On the contrary here, we have a Virgin Mary who is, who is as if she is telling us, no, you shouldn't look at me like being a woman. I'm not a woman at all. At all. I don't have any breasts. I don't have any women characteristics. I am only the mother of this child, which is between child and adult, who is here because he's going to bring, he's going to bring the light uh, in the world. These are some of, of the conventions, let's say, of the Christian art. Talking about abolishing the worldly, the worldly time, we talk about exactly about this. We see, let us say, uh, let us see this one. This is a nativity scene from Great Matera. And we see how narrative the painter is. In one fresco painting, he depicts us on the upper left, uh, the uh, arrival of, uh, 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 of the magistrates. On the upper right, uh, the arrival of um, uh, uh, of people giving gifts. On the lower right, we see uh, the bath of Jesus. And of course, of the lower left, we see Joseph, uh, uh, he's thinking, in front of a very, very strange figure uh, who probably advises him or uh, talks to him about the future. It's, it is very, very difficult to recognize who this person is. There, the, it, it's, there is a lot of conversation by the scholars about who this person may, may be. Is it a part of, of the shepherds? Is it the, is it the real God advising uh, Joseph? And in the middle, of course, we have uh, the scene of the nativity. In the scene of the nativity, we have some dozens, some dozens of symbolism. For example, we see the baby Christ. He's not in crown. Did you mention this? Let's go further. We'll talk about this later. Eyes wide open. Most of the uh, Byzantine paintings in the figures have eyes wide open to, uh, uh, excuse me, ears wide open to listen to the speech of God and eyes wide open to receive the most important, the most possible of the light of God. We see again uh, an abstract depiction of the nature and the buildings in the background we see the absence, the absence of the third dimension in uh, one of the scenes depicting the enter in Jerusalem of uh, the uh, Monastery of Transfiguration. The absence of volume in the figures. Can you see the soldiers here? No volume at all. An austerity in the depiction and the clothes that do not show at all the shape of the body. I'm, I'm staying a little bit uh, more in this uh, um, in this picture, in this fresco depicting the um, uh, uh, martyr Saint Demetrius, which is the patron saint of the place I live, the patron saint of Thessaloniki, a martyr of the fourth century AD. He was a Roman officer, Demetrius. He was one of the first Christians uh, in Thessaloniki. And um, he used to preach the new religion, to teach the Christianity uh, in his audience uh, in one of the, um, uh, of the galleries of the Roman Forum. And uh, 
she was arrested there and she was killed and his body was transferred from his friends uh, from the place he was killed to the uh, to a place onto which we have the first tomb of Demetrius and on the first tomb of Demetrius we have the first chapel and then we have the big church of St. Demetrius that we can visit today if we come uh, to Thessaloniki. It's, it's a very common um, uh, depiction that we find in almost every ch uh, church, the martyrion of St. Demetrius. Question, why aren't there any statues in the Orthodox Church? So why don't we have any statues in the Byzantine, um, in the Byzantine art, right? We have, for example, in Catholic art. We don't have because the three-dimensional sculpture is not acceptable in the Orthodox Church. It is evocative of the real, of the material world. The church, however, represents, as I told you before, a world beyond the material, beyond the real. It represents a spiritual world that in the Orthodox iconography can only be depicted in two dimensions. So literally, who are the statues in the churches? Us, we are the statues. We get into a church and getting into, by getting into a church, it is as if the real world meets the spiritual world. The material world meets the spiritual world, which is depicted in two dimensions in the churches. A few things about what we call the iconographic program in the churches of, the, of Matera, which is not uh, very much differentiated from the iconographical program of other churches in the Orthodox world. We have three zones. In the first zone, we have the lower zone. We have the depictions of martyrs, saints, and mostly military saints and uh, uh, the angels like Nickel we see here. So what is the particularity of these people? Their particularity is that they are placed almost in the same level with us, not exactly, but almost in the same level with us, a little bit in an upper level, but enough to be able to touch them. We can touch them, we can touch these people. And this is very pedagogical because they are on purpose placed almost in the same level with us because they need to convince us to become like them, to become good Christians, to convince ourselves that if we suffer, we become good Christians. And there is no big difference between being saint and a good Christian. So we will be good Christians, we will be sanctified, we will be saints, and we will take our place to the spiritual world. This means the heavens. In a second level, we see the depiction of what we call the dodecaerton. The dodecaerton is the depiction of the sins of um, of the of the life of Christ, as you can see, uh, the Last Supper, uh, Christ washing uh, his uh, uh, disciples' uh, uh, feet. Uh, all these sins are represented in a higher level. We cannot touch them. What happens, excuse me, what happens in the narthex now? In the narthex, there is a particularity. The narthex is, the, let us say, the, the first part of the church be, 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 before entering in the main church. So in the narthex, we see again, in, as a first zone, but in upper zone, as you can see here and there, all this zone is covered by depictions of people being tortured. All the martyrdom is uh, depicted in the narthex of the church. And this is also a pedagogical thing because we need to see all this and we need to understand how difficult and how we need to suffer to become good Christians and, and to find our place uh, in heavens. More or less, um, as it happens to many of, to, 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 to more or less to all of the religions, the, the Christian religion, in my opinion, it is a little bit a religion of culpability. It is, it is a little bit a religion that makes you feel 
guilty. It happens to all the religious, it happens to the real life. So all the guilt we feel is placed and depicted in the narratives. While in the main church, we see again all the episodes of, the, uh, of Christ's life. And finally, uh, in the inner part of the dome, we see the depiction of uh, Jesus as a Pantocrator. Pantocrator is the one who holds in his hand everything. So he's the leader of the world. We will go deeper analyzing uh, the conventions uh, and the symbolism of the, um, of the Christian art by, some, by, by seeing some of the examples. We see uh, the raising of Lazarus here. When I'm talking about symbolisms and conventions in the Christian art, why do we need to have symbols and conventions? There is one clear answer. We need to have symbols, conventions, and keys to open the, uh, the explanation of something which is uh, depicted because all this iconography, all these paintings are presented to illiterated people. People in most of cases during the Byzantine Empire are, are, are not capable to read a book. There is only the intelligentsia of the big cities who are capable to read books. All the others are illiterated people. So the only education they might have derived from the church, not only the religious education, but also the real, the political education, the history, all the education comes from the church. And since they cannot read, they need symbols to understand. So uh, we have a symbol here and everybody understands in the 14th century, the symbol. We have, we have the raising of Lazarus. Uh, we see all the spiritual world, we see something which is um, beyond our understanding, it's a miracle, but within the representation of miracle, in the terms of the sophisticated spiritual painting, we have though something which is very realistic. We have this figure, can you see him? He tries to cover his mouth and nose because it, is, it, it smells bad. So we have the intervening of the realism within a very, very non-realistic picture. This is one of the hundreds of the conventions of the Christian art, which are totally understandable by the illiterated people. Another convention, Christ, Jesus Christ, Anapeson, the reclining Christ. According to uh, the Old Testament, there is a text presenting uh, uh, Jesus Christ as a lion who is asleep and we are afraid to wake him. So this is exactly what represents this uh, uh, fresco paintings, which is mostly depicted in the west part of the, uh, of the church very close to the Dormition of the Virgin Mary. And uh, we have this depiction from the end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century AD. Uh, th there are some reasons for this. I will explain these reasons later. Let us stay in the iconography. We see the baby. It is the first time uh, uh, we see a real baby asleep but we have symbols of life and death here. So we can wonder whether Virgin Mary tries to cover the baby with a blanket, blanket or a shroud. It reminds us what is going to happen some years later after the crucifixion. And of course, 
this, uh, let us say, this uh, feeling of something bad is going to happen is reinforced by the angel holding the uh, symbols of the passion that you can see the reef here and the cross. Uh, it also symbolizes the resurrection. It symbolizes in the small picture, the birth, the martyrdom, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus in this picture of the Christ and a person, the reclining Christ. And in some cases in the Greek church, we have this appearance totally after the 16th century AD, which means immediately after the Ottoman occupation. So Greeks, through the Greeks, through the Byzantine paintings in the churches, dream of the lion, which is going to be awake in a few centuries to free them from the occupant, the Turks. So it is, let us say, a religious and a political, the meeting of a religious and a political um, fresco painting. Oh, so we stay longer here. Uh, last judgment. It is the picture that we see, the first thing we see getting into the church, and the last thing we see leaving the church. And this is pedagogical. It is uh, scheduled on purpose in the Byzantine churches to see the last thing to see before leaving the church to be this one, to be the last judgment. So this convinces to become good Christians because otherwise we will arrive immediately in the mouth of this monster, which is Hades. But let us become uh, more thorough in our thoughts. Uh, I just showed you the um, uh, fresco painting from um, uh, Rusano Monastery, dating back to the 16th century AD. And I'm showing you now a modern painting uh, of the same scene of uh, uh, the Last Judgment that it is depicted in the monastery of Saint, Saint Stephen, which is the uh, 20th century, 1980s approximately. What do we see in the upper part? In the center, we see Christ, which is seated on a globe between the Virgin and John. This is uh, a portrait, which is called the Daisies. Uh, Mary and John have their place as intercessors in the Last Judgment, interceding to save the sinners. And on uh, the left and the right side of them, we have uh, the 12 apostles, uh, represented like the assessors helping the judge to decide the fate of the souls of the dead. This is what happens in the upper part. We see in the, low, the lower part of this part of the picture, the angel who blows the horn, which is the signal for the resurrection of the dead. We see all these blessed people on the right, uh, knocking at the heaven's door. And the heavens, the paradise, is already occupied by the penitent thief with his cross here, Virgin Mary, the angels, and of course, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the former picture of uh, uh, the Last Judgment, we see the clouds with uh, the course of the righteous. And of course, the preparation of the throne on the right. Uh, what we see here, we don't see it clearly. We see an open book and also the instrument of the passion, which is the preparation, the etimacia, the preparation of the, of the, of the throne. It is the throne is prepared for Christ, which is going, who is going to become the judge. Horrible scenes, the uh, scales of justice uh, with the balance which is used to weigh man's deeds. Uh, you can notice that the deeds are pictures as big piles of scrolls. 
and you see the demons trying to uh, uh, to put more piles in their uh, in, in their side, so uh, so that they transfer more souls towards the hell and not towards the heaven. The river uh, of fire, which is descending from below Christ's feet, leading to the mouth of this dragon, which is the personification of Hades. Some of the departments of hell into which the light is disappeared and everything is presented as shadow. Again. So this is why we have very bright colors in the heavens. And this is why we have very dark colors in the departments of the hell because the uh, these dark colors indicate the spiritual death and the separation from Christ, the separation from Christ's love, the separation from his uncreated light, the light, uh, what we, talk, we talked about in the beginning of this presentation. This is a very interesting thing that we uh, see sometimes in the depiction of the, uh, of the Last Judgment. We see a um, uh, portrait of the divine vision of the prophet Daniel. Daniel lived uh, in the sixth century before Christ. Uh, he, he was sent uh, to Babylon to explain the dream of uh, Nabuchodonosor. This was the, uh, the king of the Assyrians. And the poor king used to see the same dream every night. He used to see a statue with uh, uh, a golden head with uh, having also um, um, uh, a cuirass made of um, what? Um, remind me, Meta. <laughs> uh, so a golden head, a cuirass. Uh, made of um, uh, not of copper, uh, uh, excuse me for this. Okay, it, it, it will come to me. The lower part uh, uh, made of copper and the legs made of uh, of terracotta. So, he um, Daniel decides to um, um, interpret this dream, this vision, and he says, "This uh, statue you see is uh, the four different kingdoms that will collapse progressively." before the arrival of the real king, which is Jesus Christ. And this is why we have exactly this representation here. I uh, will show it to you more thoroughly. We have the lioness representing Nebuchadnezzar, the Assyrian king, which is represented like, let us see, uh, a beast. The bear representing Darius, the Persian king, the four-headed leopard representing Alexander the Great, but not only him, but also his four successors, and an unknown beast representing Caesar Augustus, representing uh, uh, from the first to the fourth, the Babylonian kingdom, the Persian kingdom, the Greek kingdom, and of course, the Roman Empire. And of course, on the upper part of this same thesis, we see these four kings, the king of the Assyrians, Darius, the Persian, Alexander the Great, and Augustus. What is a little bit peculiar is that we see beasts, animals, and fish in the sea uh, holding human members like this head here and this arm over there. So what happens here? Animals and fish 
are depicted delivering up the human members they had devoured so, so that these members can be judged in the last judgment. So this is the symbol of the inherent union between soul and body. A fourth snapshot, let's talk about what uh, we call a horror vacui. Horror vacui is a Latin phrase, which means uh, uh, the uh, horror of the empty space. So every painter in the Byzantine uh, art tries to cover every space of the church. There is no space of the church, there is no wall, there is no um, wall of the church uncovered by paintings. Everything is covered by painting, and you can see uh, uh, another one here depicting the horror of Akwe. I forgot to tell you something, but uh, I'm taking the, uh, the, the I'm, I'm given the chance now. Can you see the lower part of this picture here? Ostrich egg. The yes, ostrich yes. egg that we see rarely in the churches, but we see them sometimes. Uh, this is the symbol of the care of Jesus to us. And since Jesus uh, takes care of us, but from a distance, uh, this is symbolized by the ostrich egg, because ostrich in the, is the only bird in the, uh, uh, in the kingdom of the fauna, which doesn't sit on the eggs. It is staying, it stays aside watching the eggs, the way Jesus watches us. And this is why we don't see other eggs in the churches, but the ostrich eggs. Another convention, we see a very common scene of Pontius Pilatus uh, washing his hands, but suddenly we have somebody appearing very dramatically behind him. It is his wife whispering to him to change his mind. So this is a symbol of the arrival of the divine arrival of, or of the arrival of the Satan. Nobody knows. If it is God in here, this means that uh, Pontius Pilatus is going to change his mind, so the history is going to stop there. But if it is Satan, this means that uh, he's going to continue and all the history is going to uh, continue until the crucifixion, the crucifixion and the resurrection. So it's another convention of the Christian art, which is very easily understandable by uh, the people uh, getting into the church. I'm coming into uh, the, uh, the central place, the central uh, part of the nativity scene uh, in the cave. And the cave, of course, represents not only the, uh, the birth, but also uh, the, uh, the death. And this is why the child is not really placed in a cradle, but in a sarcophagus. Have you ever noticed this one? So we have a meaningfully, meaningfully constituted synthesis, which is uh, developed to show us not only the real things, which is the nativity, but also uh, uh, to go further and to show us the future of this, uh, of this child. A very particular scene, uh, uh, which I wanted very much to share with you, it is something we find sometimes in the uh, um, in the entrance of the churches in uh, this department which is called the narthex of the church it is uh, the hermit Sisois in front of alexander's tomb alexander the great died in the fourth century end of the fourth century bc after having conquered the almost the then known world he died in babylon I remind you, he died in Babylon. He died in the same place where Daniel died, and he died in the same palace where Daniel died. Daniel died in the sixth century BC in the palace of the Assyrians. Alexander the Great dies in the end of the fourth century BC in the same palace. 
So maybe the uh, the prophecy of uh, of Daniel has to do also with Alexander the Great. And this is why he talks about Alexander the Great. But this is another story. Alexander the Great dies in Babylon, and suddenly the generals of him do not know what to do with the body. So they do not immediately decide to, uh, to send the body in Macedonia, back in Macedonia, to be treated like a king, meaning burn it and put it in a Macedonian tomb, put the ashes in a tomb. What they do is to mummify the corpse. So the corpse is mummified, and for almost two years, the corpse stays in Babylon with the generals. And not only that, the mummy Alexander uh, accompanies the, uh, uh, the generals when they have uh, to take decisions in the banquets. I can assume that he is even offered a cup of wine while they are feasting. And two years later, the generals say, what do we do? We need to treat this body according to the Macedonian manners, to the Macedonian mortuary practices. This means we transfer the body immediately to Macedonia. And this is what they do. They take the decision. They create a beautiful um, chariot. They put the mummy inside. The mummy sets, sets off on a trip from Babylon to arrive to Macedonia, to the city nearby Thessaloniki, which is called Ege, the ancient Macedonian kingdom. It never arrived because in the border between Syria and Egypt, Ptolemy, one of the generals, steals the body and takes the body with him, the mummy, the mummified, the mummified Alexander the Great, into his palace in Alexandria because <coughs> the ecumenical world has been divided already into four departments, the four kingdoms. And the one of the kingdoms was the kingdom of Egypt taken by <clears throat> Ptolemy. So Ptolemy becomes powerful by having the mummy of Alexander in his palace. And we see that, we know that people went there to see Alexander's tomb. How do we know this? We know it by very famous people who visited them, not only Sisois. Before Sisois, it was uh, Julius Caesar, who visited Alexander's tomb, and he offers him his crown. Some centuries later, the Roman Emperor Caracalla visits in the same way, like Ciso is here, the tomb of Alexander, and he says, I'm going to touch him. So he touches him, and accidentally he breaks Alexander's nose. And finally, Ciso is, which is depicted in most of the churches, he uh, visits Alexander's tomb, to express what the vanity of this world. If we read the text, we, it, it says something like, "You, you were the first. You were, you, you were the biggest of the kings. We, 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 we were. The, you, you were the most glorious of the kings. You did this. You did that. You, you conquered the whole world within ten years. And the end of yours is exactly the same like the end of all the other people. So this is the vanity of the real of the material." world. And this is exactly what it is expressed by picturing this, um, uh, uh, this fresco painting in the narthex before entering to the main church. What is the mistake here? The mistake is that Alexander's tomb is depicted by having inside uh, skeletal remains, while by the ancient authors we know that Alexander the Great was uh, mummified. Let us talk about two exceptional painters. The one is Theophanes from Crete, and the other one is Francos Catalanos from Thebes. Thebes is a city between Meteora and Athens, let us say, in the central Greece. The one represents, Theophanes represents, let us say, the classicism uh, of the Byzantine art, and the other one, the Baroque, let us say, um, a, a dramatization towards uh, from the stylized painting towards the to the expressionism. Both work during the 16th century AD, and both uh, have left uh, their uh, uh, their handmarks in uh, in Meteora. 
uh, Theophanes in uh, uh, the um, um, church of the, the main church, the Catholic home church of the monastery of uh, Saint Nicholas, and Francos Catellanos in the Catholic home of the monastery of Barlaham. Barlaham. We see Theophanes in the Catholic home of uh, Saint Nicholas the Anap of Sass, and we see some of the uh, uh, some let us say details of. Uh, uh, the, the paintings of, um, of Theophanes, like this one, Jonah and the whale, uh, Adam uh, giving the names of uh, the animals in the heavens, the Dormition of a saint, and the arrival of the thief in the heavens uh, in a different uh, presentation here with Abraham holding in his arms uh, Lazarus. Take a look at the narrative of the narrative of this scene of the Dormition of Saint Ephraim, which depicts exactly what happened uh, uh, with uh, the, the hermits in the desert. Take a look at the sobriety of the scene in the depiction of uh, uh, Saint John the Theologist with Prochorus. The liveliness of the forms um, in um, the depiction of the tempest, the plasticity of the faces of uh, Theophanes from Crete. This uh, reminds us very, very much of the Renaissance painters, this one and that one. The perfection in the color, and of course, the perfection in the design. This one, this painter, is considered to be the classicism, but it goes beyond the conventions of the art, of the Byzantine art that we presented before. It goes a step beyond, and it meets a little bit the conquests of the Italian Renaissance. So he, he's going to meet a little bit the conventions, not of the Christian art, not, not, not of the Byzantine art, but the conventions of the Renaissance art, meaning the real, uh, the, the depiction of the real and the material world. And this one will go furthermore, Francos Catellanos, he is going to be more dramatic. He uses much more the forms in motion, the accumulation of the buildings behind in the background that create a very dense and turbulent setting. Of course, he uses mostly bright reddish colors. And we see clearly here the contrast between the light and the shadow in this nativity. So this, this is very close to the uh, um, um, to, the, to the Italian Renaissance with all these decorative figures, with all these uh, colors. It goes very, very much uh, in contrast to what we saw with Theophanes. And of course, in some of the uh, pictures like this one presenting uh, Saint Cyril, we see the spirituality of the emotion. And of course, the intensity, the intensity, the agitation, the realism, and all this drama with Judah and Jesus here. Some of the exceptional painters that we don't know their names. One of those is this one. Uh, this is a portable icon situated uh, uh, at the iconostasi of Great Meteoron, the Metamorphosis, the, the uh, Transfiguration uh, Monastery. It is called the Unfading Rose. This derives from one of the hymns of uh, uh, for Virgin Mary, the Akathistus, the Akathist hymn. But this one is, uh, dates back to the 18th century uh, AD. It is clearly influenced by the Western painters, while this one is, let us say, the archetype of the Paleologian art the, uh, of the 14th century AD, 
it is the virgin lamenting, she misses Jesus. It is a part of the crucifixion. It is as if we cut a part of the crucifixion to present Virgin Mary without her baby. Some examples of the wood, the wood curved iconostasis of Meteora and some details. And of course, um, some exceptional monasteries like this chapel of St. George that became famous even from the 16th century AD, according to the tradition, to the local tradition of Kastraki, which is the, the village uh, uh, nearby. Uh, um, um, a Turkish officer fell from his horse in this place and he was very badly injured. So he would almost, uh, he almost lost his life, but suddenly his wife appeared to see him wounded and she prayed to St. George because uh, I, I don't know if you know this, Turks uh, also during the Ottoman occupation, Turks, uh, even, even if we have a, a different religion, the, the occupants uh, believed in the miracles of St. George. So she prayed uh, to St. George and St. George, according to the, the tradition, saved the life of her husband. So she offered uh, her scarf to say to St. George. And from that moment onwards, a tradition was created. Every day of the celebration of St. George, the people of the nearby village Kastraki climb up like that to the rocks to offer a piece of tissue into uh, the shrine, the chapel of St. George. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, to end this presentation by showing you some, uh, let us say, touristic pictures to um, seduce you to come and visit Meteora, to convince you to come to Meteora. or to convince you not to come because sometimes it becomes very dangerous. This is Meteor and this is the village Kastraki. This is the monastery of Barlam of the 14th century AD and on the uh, upper uh, right part, the monastery of uh, Great Meteor. Some goats replacing the absence of the hermits even from the 9th century AD. Goats depicted also in the engravings of the 19th century, here and here. And the general view of three monasteries, four monasteries in, in engraving of the 19th century. This is the village Kastraki uh, on the slopes at the foot, uh, actually, of uh, Meteora rocks. And again, a part of village Kastraki at the foot of uh, the rocks. And I have to tell you good night because it is already night here in Greece. By showing you this uh, beautiful picture of uh, the village Kastraki, which, uh, which is my village. This is the village uh, that I spent the first two years of my life. So um, I'm, I'm going to uh, end this uh, presentation uh, with uh, this picture of the full moon under the village Kastraki. I'm grateful to you, Father, Ilya, and to you, Maria, for inviting me uh, to present you uh, 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 one of the beautiful places of, uh, of my country. Um, the message is that uh, traveling, talking about antiquities, talking about beautiful things, talking about uh, 
um, uh, whoever's in heritage talking about the past, if we know how to talk, and if uh, uh, we talk about this with real love, we become better people, better persons in our lives. And this is also our aims uh, as uh, archaeologists and as tourist guides in our places. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Kostas. Uh, really great presentation, especially the talk on iconography and such. I encourage our guests to ask questions. You can mute yourself, certainly, and ask Konstantinos any questions that you'd like on the subject. Um, Konstantinos, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions myself. Since there is a, a conglomerate or assembly monasteries in Meteora region, uh, how do they govern? Is it like similar to Mount Athos, where they have uh, like a, a synod of abbots and abbesses, or these monasteries are fully independent of each other and just happen to be in the same geographical area? Yes, uh, there is there is a small difference between um, the Mount Athos area and the uh, the monasteries of Meteora. Uh, of course, there is all there is always a Protos. Protos is the first. It is the uh, the abbot of the great Meteoron, which is the uh, the governor of, of all the, the the six monasteries, the four uh, monasteries with men with monks, and the two monasteries with with the two nunneries. But every monastery has his abbot, his igumenos uh, as well. But there is no, let us say, uh, like in the Mount Athos, there is not a capital like Karyes into which is situated uh, the, uh, the assembly of the, of the old, which is in Karyes and Mount Athos. In Meteora, there is no such a thing. But in um, uh, what we call the, uh, the way of life, they continue having the same way of life, which is called a Sinobetic life, like most of the, of the monasteries of, uh, of Mount Athos. And apart from that, most of the monks of, Mount, of, of Meteora became monks in Meteora after having become monks in Mount Athos. I'm giving you the example of Athanasius, uh, which is the founder of Great Meteora. Before arriving in Meteora, he was monk in Moni Megistis Lavers in the monastery of Megistis Lavers in the Mount Athos. So, um, it, it is more or less the same organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you showed us pictures of one monastery that uh, you indicated is abandoned, but seems to be in a very decent shape. Is it that there are no monks? They left there recently? There are, no, or? There, there are no monks. No, there are no monks. Yeah, yeah. But why that monastery is not functioning just because of the shortage of people? Because it looked like it was inhabited relatively recently. Mm -hmm. Buildings look and I don't. Shape. I don't really know, Father. I don't mm -hmm. really know. Okay. All right. Well, if you have any questions, please, uh, um, uh, Constantinus. Maybe, uh, uh, in a way of a, a personal favor, I don't think that you would have any images. But can you tell a little bit about the history in the village of Kalampaka, because it seems to be a very ancient church with some of the very very uh, uh, archaic, very archaic features uh, uh, inside, like the um, anvil Yambo. in the middle of the church, and some okay. other. Things. Can you talk a little bit about it? No, no I, I, I don't have any images to show you. Uh, you you're taking me by surprise here. But Kalampata has uh, a very important church of, uh, of the Dormition of the of the Virgin Mary, uh, dating back uh, from the 11th to the 14th century AD, but mm -hmm. what it is um, uh, um, impressing inside there is um, is the um, the embo the marble the marble embo which is situated in the middle of uh, of uh, of the church which is something uh, that remained as uh, as uh, let us say as an element from uh, from the ninth century AD this is from the from the early Christian period so it is it is not used to have early Christian uh, characteristic in, 
in Middle Byzantine churches, and this is the particularity of this uh, of this church. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michael. I, I had, yes, I had, Go ahead. I had one question. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, in one of the last judgment icons, it looked to me as if there were angels at the in the in the river of fire toward the top. And I've only seen that in one other last judgment icon. I assumed it meant the angels were diving in to rescue sinners, but I don't know. Uh, do you do you know or do you, Father Ilya? Uh, if Constantinus would scroll up, back. maybe I look. I could not. It's it's fairly far back. It was early in your present in the icon part of the presentation. Can you see them here? Yeah, there, yeah, there, yeah. there. Yes, yes. Okay, these these angels are trying to pull back. The, uh, the the so-called sinners that were pulled by the uh, by the demons you see you see really fights between demons and angels here angels mm -hmm. on the top and demons on the lower part yeah that's what i assumed but wasn't sure mm -hmm. thank you in some villages we can even see names here in small villages where we have not in meteor but in villages having this kind of churches um, People who dislike the neighbor can even uh, can even uh, engrave their names in um, uh, in the uh, in the river of fire. I have seen such a thing in small villages in uh, in northern Greece. Somebody who hates his uh, his neighbor, he may write his name discreetly here. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question from one of our listeners. Uh, are there any uh, similar geological formations, mountains, that look somewhat like Meteora? I could think of some in China and in Georgia, but are there any in Greece, for that matter, or somewhere where you may know? No, I don't think so. It's, it's, it's a unique, unique phenomenon geologically uh, in, in Greece. Uh, of course, there are, uh, there are lots of geological phenomena like Grand Canyon, or, uh, but this one is something unique. This is why it is visited, visited by most of people all over the world who plan to, to visit Greece. From 1960, uh, Meteora, uh, uh, Meteora is, is a place which is mostly visitable by, by people coming to visit Greece. It's, it's, it is chosen by, by the visitors mm -hmm. because they don't see something like that all over the world. Yes, certainly. It's really unique. Constantinus, was Meteora and uh, monasteries there ever served as a spiritual beacon somewhat in effect like Mount Athos? Because in fact, there are many important concentration of the monasteries, but they're, they're just there. They didn't have such a significant and lasting legacy in the church life, which is, I guess, all right. So with particular case of Meteora, is it just, they just there or they at some point played an important role uh, similar to those of Mount Athos? Listen, we, uh, we, we have to be honest here. Mount Athos is beyond tourism. Mount Athos is hidden from the tourism. Mount Athos is one of the few places all over the world which is which, which has kept its mysticism, its uh, spirituality. I have visited many times Mount Athos. It's not the real, it's not the same feeling we have by visiting Meteora. Uh, it, is, it is a very sad what I say because I come from this place. I was born there. Mm -hmm. I've been working in this place for, th for 13 years. I, I know every stone there, every monastery. But it is sad that Meteora, uh, it, it, it is a spiritual place only after the gate of the monastery is closed for the tourists, uh -huh. even if you are in or outside of the monastery. So it is preferable to visit it not in a crowded period. And um, um, in a way, you feel this spirituality when you are in a small group and when you are abundant in a corner, not within the flood of the tourism, which doesn't happen 
by visiting the Mount Athos. To visit Mount Athos, we need to have a special permission, uh, to have a special permit. You need to stay three to five nights. You visit three or four monasteries and you feel the whole thing. You participate to all the masses, to all the liturgies. You participate to all, to the whole life, to the whole monastic life. You are not forced, but you do it. You wake up three o'clock in the morning. You you follow um, you, you, you follow a service. You follow a mass, standing for two or three hours. You follow the whole program, and you feel it. You feel the darkness. You feel the spiritual world. You feel the mysticism of uh, of the monasteries. In order to feel this one, I have felt it once, just once. I was uh, I tried to uh, to participate to the Eastern liturgy some 10 years ago. Th this was the one moment that I felt this, uh, this mysticism and this spirituality in, uh, in Meteora. So my suggestion is that we visit Meteora, but we visit it just before the arrival of the first group, or we visit it as the last group of the day, let us say. If we talk about visitors. Mm -hmm. A question very much on the same note from one of our listeners. Uh, it goes like this. When we were in Meteora, we were told that there are anchorites, hermits, that live in caves and that accept people for confession spiritual help. Can you please tell us if you know of any and of the life of Meteora ascetics? So are there any or is it a urban legend? I didn't understand the question. Excuse me, could you repeat that it? There are hermits living in the caves in Meteora, separate There aren't months. anymore. There aren't anymore. No, there aren't anymore. Uh, I, I think I think that was clear. The hermits in the uh, in, in the caves lived in the caves from the 9th to the 13th century AD. After that, they started creating monastic societies on the top of the rocks. So the 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 hermitage's life or the the hermits and the ascetic life stopped in the 13th century AD and the, the in the 13th and 14th century they started having this communal life this creation of the monastic communities the monastic societies so it it, it was never uh, in the in, in the same times hermits and uh, and monastic societies but not not anymore so there are no now, secret there are no secret elders there no like uh, for example you, you 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 want me to compare meteora and mount athos for example in mount athos there are skite still in mount athos there are uh, the the big monasteries and very close to the monastery or very far away from the monastery there are some hermitages and we can see uh, monks isolated in their cells there or in their skite something that does not happen in uh, in Meteora uh, monasteries. What is the approximate total population of monks and nuns that reside in those six monasteries? A few, uh, le less than 30 totally. Less than 30 totally. Le less, less than 30 in, the, in mm -hmm. the six monasteries. Okay. All right, well, are there any more questions, dear friends? It's getting quite late in uh, Greece, so I don't want to uh, overexhaust our wonderful no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to be with you. Okay, so, all right. Uh, and, and also, I, 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 owe you, uh, I owe you 18 minutes. Ah, no, 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 no. That was my mistake at the beginning was, was regarding the time. So, any questions? Well, we just hope Costas to see you next year. This year, it probably would be way too difficult, but we have here uh, uh, Father Deacon Evangelos who hope to uh, take his people to Mount Athos next September. And mm -hmm. maybe we could also add a tour to Greece that we did with Maria some years back. So maybe we are going to see you Lord willing and maybe we'll be able to visit in person wonderful mm -hmm. places and those meteor monasteries and it's just phenomenal area in general. Okay, well, 
thank you for wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, this is very good to see I you after see some you years. Yes. Not virtually, but uh, in yes. real life. And in real life. Not, not from a distance. Okay. Not from a distance. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Thank you. God bless. And bye bye, Father. Be very well. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a nice afternoon. Bye bye. Bye, bye everyone.